Greetings uh, from the National Concrete Bridge Council uh, and want to welcome everybody to our webinar today on surface applied cathodic protection. This is the last webinar of a six part webinar series we've been doing with the folks from Vector Corrosion and some of their uh, team members um, and looking forward to today's uh, today's presentation. So this series was brought to you uh, between uh, a partnership with the National Concrete Bridge Council and Vector Corrosion Technologies. Um, the National Concrete Bridge Council is an uh, allied group of industry organizations that are dedicated to promoting quality concrete bridge construction. You can see the industry members uh, there in the left-hand side of your screen. I won't read them all out to you. Um, all of the organizations that are members uh, of the National Concrete Bridge Council. I'm Greg Freeby, the chair of the National Concrete Bridge Council and also the executive director of the American Segmental Bridge Institute. And uh, again, welcome everybody here today. I'll turn it over to Dave. He's gonna talk about uh, some another webinar series they have coming up. Thank you, Greg. Um, coming up uh, next month, we're gonna be starting a new webinar series on design. Um, and specifically focusing on design of uh, cathodic protection systems to extend the surface life of uh, reinforced concrete structures. And so um, hopefully this is of interest to you and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Great. Thanks, Dave. I think that's a great opportunity uh, for uh, the viewers of this series to uh, take an even deeper dive and learn more, uh, certainly on the design side. So thank you uh, for, for doing that. The National Concrete Bridge Council is also uh, embarking then on a series of webinars that will start in April. They'll be, uh, I think it's the third Thursday of each month, starting April 17th uh, and running through uh, the end of the year. The first session is on sustainability and how it affects concrete bridges presented by uh, Emily Lorenz. Registration is open on the National Concrete Bridge Council website. You see the web URL there uh, if you want to type it in or you usually can use your favorite search engine and search National Concrete Bridge Council and you'll find that also want to mention on that web page, if you scroll down, you'll also find an announcement uh, about an in-person seminar we're doing on Priestress Concrete Bridge Design. You can register for that. It's in person April 24th and 25th in Atlanta, Georgia. So again, that and a number of other announcements you can find on the NCBC website and encourage you to, to seek out that information. So. We'll get going with the rest of the webinar for today's session. I want to mention uh, we do have an opportunity, a little question competition, and that is for, uh, whoever puts in the best questions at the end of our session will receive a $100 gift card and uh, our speaker will be judging uh, who submitted the best questions. So again, encourage you to submit questions. We will do Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, our buddy Ben Novak will serve as the moderator uh, and walk us through the Q&A session. So with that, I think my next duty is to introduce our speaker. Uh, I've called on him already without an introduction, which is maybe a little rude, uh, but David Whittemore is uh, the President and Chief Innovation Officer of Vector Corrosion Technologies. Uh, he's at a company that specializes in the repair and corrosion protection of reinforced concrete structures. Uh, I'll just a little shout out to Vector. They've been a great partner with the National Concrete Bridge Council, uh, helping put on this series of webinars to, to help expand the knowledge that's out there on uh, on bridge, what we call bridge stewardship. Dave's also a registered professional engineer and an NACE cathodic protection specialist. He's on a number of uh, boards and committees, and I won't read them all to you. Uh, again, David, uh, David has been a great partner of the industry and uh, I suspect a lot of you uh, online today even already have connections with Dave. So with that, I'm going to shut off my camera and turn everything over to Dave. So thank you, Dave, for joining us today. Thank you, Greg. Okay, so for today, uh, we're going to talk about surface applied uh, cathodic protection and specifically focusing on concrete bridges and concrete bridge elements. And in the webinar today, we really just want to touch on these five points. Uh, briefly talk about corrosion of steel and concrete, 
and then talk about cathodic corrosion protection systems in general and specifically focus in and talk on impressed current cathodic protection systems and galvanic cathodic protection systems. And in each of these cases today, we want to show uh, field project examples, uh, actual case studies of where different types of surface applied cathodic protection systems have been applied uh, to uh, reinforce concrete uh, bridge elements. So with that, we'll go into the first part, and that is um, just a very quick um, few comments with regard to the corrosion of steel in concrete. Concrete is generally a very, very durable material um, and it will last a very, very long time. Um, but one of the things that will eventually get to concrete is if you're in a very corrosive, um, particularly a salt laden environment and the salt soaks into the concrete to the depth of the reinforcing steel in sufficient quantity, um, corrosion will typically result and corrosion will result in uh, eventually delamination and spalling mechanical damage to the concrete as well as loss of cross-section area for the reinforcing steel that is in there and you can see that illustrated in these two photographs. Um, there are uh, industry organizations, including the International Concrete Repair Institute, which is part of the National Concrete Bridge Council, that have very good um, reference information available with regard to how to properly repair concrete, certainly from a physical and structural point of view, you know, square cut edges, chipping around behind the reinforcing steel, replacing the defective material with um, good new concrete, uh, and in that way, concrete is is very, very good because it is it is a very repairable material. But if you do a repair, a localized repair on a concrete structure that is contaminated uh, with chlorides, for example, on a wider basis than where you're doing the repairs, you can create a situation as illustrated here where you have a repair section and you still have um, adjacent areas with salt contaminated concrete and you have you will have a voltage or a potential difference between the two areas and this will result in corrosion continuing within the concrete section that is outside or surrounding the repair even if the repairs are done properly and if you walk around you will see many examples of this this is from a florida dot bridge that was repaired a number of years ago and you can see the uh, um, the white marked areas here on the top of this repair and in the background on that repair where corrosion has continued and will continue in the parent concrete because it's still salt contaminated and not all of the contaminated material was removed. So one option for durable repairs to remove all of the contaminated material the other option for repair is to employ some form of cathodic protection. And in one of the earlier seminars, um, they talked about localized galvanic protection in repairs to make repairs last longer. And in that situation, you add um, a galvanic anode, which has a more negative electrical potential than the steel within the repair and also a more negative potential than the steel within the chloride contaminated concrete. And by doing that, you minimize or eliminate the corrosion in this localized area adjacent to the repair. And, and you can extend the service life of the repairs without removing this additional chloride contaminated concrete. And that works very, very well on a localized basis, but the further away from the repair that you get, the less impact this anode will have. And, um, and so if you want to protect a somewhat wider area, you're going to have to do something more. You're either going to have to remove all of the chloride contaminated concrete, or you're going to have to do something more than simply putting some anodes into the repairs themselves. And this is where surface applied uh, cathodic protection systems come into play. These systems are ideal for portions of the concrete structures that are contaminated 
and that contaminated concrete is not being removed. Um, but where that concrete has not progressed to such an extent that the concrete is physically damaged or spalled. And, um, and so just to illustrate that, um, here are two pictures, uh, the one on the left, uh, a bridge column, um, which would be suitable for a surface applied cathodic protection system. You can see that it's in physically in good condition. Um, and the one on the right, bridge abutment, that um, it, both of these structures are chloride contaminated, but the one on the right has been left uh, longer, and you can see that there's a lot of concrete damage that has occurred. And because there's so much concrete damage, um, it really doesn't make sense to go in and do conquer repairs and then do surface applied cathodic protection over the whole area. Um, you may as well just do conquer repairs and cathodic protection by some other method. Um, or just remove all of the chloride contaminated concrete in the example on the right. And the one on the left um, is in a condition that would be very suitable for surface applied corrosion protection or cathodic protection. So um, prior to going through and showing you a number of case studies, I want to just um, explain the, num the different types of systems that are out there and then, uh, and then explain how they work. And then we'll go and show you one or two examples of each um, each as we go through. So um, the first is uh, impressed current cathodic protection systems. I'll explain what those are. And I've got a couple of different examples of that in the presentation. Um, going to touch on electrochemical chloride extraction. Um, it's a form of impressed current cathodic protection uh, that can be that can be used to provide uh, uh, protection uh, in a surface applied manner and uh, galvanic cathodic protection. I'll show a couple of examples of uh, where galvanic cathodic protection can be used as a surface applied uh, technique as well. So first, just to explain how these different systems work. Um, this is a very simplified sketch of an impressed current cathodic protection system. Um, in all of these cases, we will have some type of an anode that is applied to the surface of the concrete. Um, you can see it illustrated here, and I'm pointing it to it with the red dot. Um, that anode is applied to the surface of con concrete, which is what we're talking about today. And in this case, with an impressed current system, that anode is electrically connected to the steel, but with a low voltage DC direct current power supply connected in between. So uh, for an impressed current system, you have an external DC power supply that is connected between the anode and the reinforcing steel, and the power supply is actually providing the current and pushing it through um, the system that is uh, created by, um, by the installation itself. The, the next type of system, um, which I'll touch on um, and I'll show you one example of is uh, electrochemical chloride extraction. Um, an electrochemical chloride extraction system is a form of impressed current uh, cathodic protection, which is installed and operated temporarily. It's installed and operated for a certain period of time. And once the steel is passivated or is returned to a non-corroding condition, the system is turned off and removed from the structure. So it's an impressed current system that's installed and operated for a period of time and then removed from the structure. So it's a form of impressed current system and has the components that an impressed current system has. The other main type of system that I'll show you a couple of examples of are galvanic cathodic protection uh, systems. And these systems use uh, also an anode, in this case, it's a galvanic anode, and that galvanic anode is connected directly to the reinforcing steel. There is no power supply um, involved in these systems, and there is a direct connection between the reinforcing steel and the anode itself. So um, that's just so you have um, an understanding of how the system um, are differ, and the galvanic systems work because you will use some type of an anode such as zinc that has a 
voltage or a potential that is more negative than the reinforcing steel in concrete. And as a result of the difference in the voltage or the difference in the potential, electrons will naturally flow from the zinc anode to the steel. And um, as a result, the steel will be protected from corrosion. In these cases, the zinc anode will obviously corrode, but they will give off electrons that will protect the steel from corroding. And that's how the galvanic systems work. OK, so project examples are always, I think, more interesting than just uh, trying to explain things um, in too much detail. So uh, this first project example is an impressed current uh, cathodic protection example uh, from Oregon DOT. Um, it's called Big Creek Bridge. Um, this is a bridge that's on uh, US Route uh, 101 on the Oregon coast. Um, the bridge was designed um, by a very famous uh, bridge designer and opened back in the 1930s. Um, it's only 180 feet long, but it's an interesting design. And this system, this bridge, I should say, had a metallized zinc impressed current cathodic protection system on it that was installed in 1997. And after that system um, basically ran its course um, and was no longer functional, um, Oregon DOT decided to install a conductive coating system on this bridge instead. And uh, so I'll just walk you through the steps on this particular job. So the first step uh, for many of these projects is to provide access. So you need physically access to the structure in order to do the work. And you can see in this case, the access is provided by a hanging platform, which allows access to the full underside of the bridge and all of the beams that are part of the scope of work in this particular case. Next, um, after the existing or what was remaining of the existing um, uh, zinc system um, was removed from the concrete surface and the concrete surfaces were prepared. Um, and you can see over here in the picture on the left, the zinc has been removed from the concrete surface and you have a nice concrete surface to work with. The first step of the installation here was to install the primary anodes. Primary anodes are shown here. Um, those are basically platinum clad um, conductive wires that are laid into a layer of the conductive coating and they act as your primary distribution of the current um, to the areas that are to be protected. The next step of the installation is the is the installation of the conductive coating itself. Um, this conductive coating is a carbon based um, paint and um, it has enough carbon in it that the coating itself is electrically conductive. And uh, so on the left, you can see this black colored um, paint has been applied over the primary anodes, which are running along the underside of these beams, as well as all of the remainder of the concrete surface. And uh, another picture of the same thing on, on the right here. When you install a an impressed current system um, because you're connecting it to a power supply and you have to apply a voltage um, to all the different areas. Um, it's important that the air, that the overall area is broken down into what we call zones, so sections or areas. And even within those zones, it's broken down into subzones so that you are able to monitor the the current flow in the different areas to make sure that each area is getting uniformly protected and uh, that you don't have all of the current going in some small areas and other areas effectively unprotected. So when you're laying out the system and, uh, and applying the conductive coating, in this particular case, the conductive coating is applied in sections with gaps between each section so that uh, they're electrically isolated and the different sections can be monitored. So after the conductive coating is installed, the final step, of, well, not the final step, but one of the final steps of the installation is to provide, is to install the top coat. Uh, the top coat is um, 
is a coating that goes over top of the black colored coating and it's really there just to provide the aesthetic color that you want in this case a light gray color and uh, to provide some uh, uv um, protection um, but it's really a decorative or a aesthetic uh, top coat that goes over the conductive black um, uh, carbon um, anode coating itself and and then obviously your cables are connected um, between your power supply and the anode as well as the power supply to the reinforcing steel and uh, and then the system is turned on and is operated you know over over time and picture on the right is picture of the uh, structure after uh, it was recoded and uh, put back into service. So that's one type of impressed current cathodic protection system. The another type of, sur of surface applied impressed current cathodic protection system um, that I wanted to illustrate is uh, a system that is where you use arc sprayed zinc as the impressed current anode. Um, and the project example that I'm going to show you here is uh, Yakina Bray Bridge. This is also an Oregon DOT job. Um, this is a again a bridge that was built back in the 1930s and is very aesthetically a beautiful bridge. Um, this bridge, the DOT had put a zinc impressed current cathodic protection system on this bridge in 1992 and uh, it ran for about 25 years and uh, the that system was essentially removed and reinstalled um, starting in 2020. Um, so you can see a little picture of the bridge on the right or a small portion of it. Um, for these systems, as with previously, you're going to need access. So on the left photo, you can see a picture of access being installed for to access the the spandrel columns and arches um, that were the primary sections that were protected here. And on the right, you're going to see a picture of the containment structure. Um, this application involves um, the application of uh, arc sprayed zinc. And in a lot of environmental situations, you will have to um, maybe contain that application for the dust, uh, the zinc dust that is created. And in some cases out in Oregon, for example, it's also very damp and humid. Um, that may be too wet for proper application of the zinc. So you may need to control the humidity inside the containment as well, which is a, a major issue out in on the Oregon coast. So uh, similar to the last project, um, the existing uh, zinc system, which you can see the remnants of here, um, that is removed from the concrete surface um, by uh, typically by sandblasting or abrasive blasting. And then the new layer of zinc, the new zinc anode is installed. And in this case, um, the anode itself is this is this layer of electrically conductive zinc that is being applied to the concrete surface. And similar to the previous example, the current is provided by um, an external power supply, a DC rectifier, which powers the system. With all of these um, impressed current cathodic protection systems, you are going to need not only the power supply, but you're going to need electrical connections between the power supply and the anode, um, as well as electrical connections between the power supply and the reinforcing steel. So um, in this particular case for the zinc system, this is a picture showing the electrical connection between the positive terminal of the DC power supply that connects to the zinc that's on the surface of the concrete. There will be similar connections the details a little different, but there are similar connections where the electrical lead wires from the rectifier are making connections to the reinforcing steel inside the concrete. And in order to monitor um, these systems, whether they're impressed current or galvanic, uh, you typically are going to use reference electrodes. 
And these reference electrodes, you can see one here being held by this person on the right. Um, they are installed either into a drilled hole in the concrete or in a in a concrete uh, repair. Um, and that reference electrode allows you to measure the potential or more simply the voltage of the reinforcing steel and to see how that is impacted by the current that's being applied. And there are standards out there that allow you to measure that and to determine whether the steel is fully protected or not. And finally, with all of the applications, I'm just going to show it here first because on these, it's just as important on impressed current systems as it is on galvanic systems. Uh, quality control and quality control of the installation is, is very important. And two of the things that you want to measure, um, at least if you're doing a arc sprayed zinc system, it would be number one is to measure the thickness of the zinc itself. So uh, this is a section of the zinc that's been taken off of the surface and you're physically measuring the thickness um, uh, with a meter. And it happens in this case to be 16 uh, mils thick. And the, another thing that you're typically going to want to measure to make sure that you're doing a good installation is the bond strength of the coating to the concrete surface. And that's usually done by um, a bond or a pull test uh, where you basically adhere a dolly um, onto the surface of the, the what you want to test and then you apply a load to it and you pull that dolly with the known surface area off of the concrete surface and you measure the load which is converted to uh, uh, PSI in this particular case and you can see 268 PSI uh, pull strength for the zinc coating that's on the concrete surface in this example. Okay and with all systems um, it's highly recommended that you should monitor them and if you're going to install an impressed current system that is really critical. Um, the image on the left um, shows a list of a table of the different um, bridges in Oregon that have uh, active ICCP impressed current cathodic protection systems running on them and the image on the right shows uh, some monitoring data for one of those bridges and when you have an external like you have a DC power supply in the field it's real important to uh, make sure that you're monitoring that and make sure that it stays on and uh, because if the power goes off or somehow gets disconnected for some reason then obviously you're not having any protection at that point at all so um, monitoring is is very important. So that's impressed current uh, cathodic protection systems. I'm going to just briefly touch on electrochemical fluoride extraction um, because this is a surface applied technique as well. Um, in this situation, you have a temporary system that is applied to the concrete surface. That temporary system is connected to a DC power supply, exactly the same as an impressed current cathartic protection system would be with connections to the temporary anode and connections to the reinforcing steel. And when this is turned on, you charge the rebar negatively and the anode positively. And in this case, instead of just running it at a low current to prevent the steel from corroding, here you run it at a much higher current. And the purpose is to migrate the chlorides away from the steel and towards the anode. They're not all going to go out of the concrete, but they're going to tend to move in that direction. And you want to create a zone around the rebar where uh, there's less chlorides and the steel is no longer um, corroding. Um, so um, the picture on the left shows installation of a chloride extraction system on a number of substructure piers for uh, a section of elevated expressway in uh, this is a Nebraska uh, DOT uh, structure in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, and this um, system is connected up to a DC power supply, same as traditional impressed current system, but it's only going to be installed and operated for a period of time. And when it meets the acceptance criteria, that system is removed. And 
the concrete at that point, um, the steel is in a non-corroding condition, and it's really a question of how well can you protect it from becoming recontaminated again in the future. And in this case, uh, what the DOT did is they applied a protective coating over the concrete after the chloride extraction was done. Okay, um, so the other main type of cathodic protection system that I want to show you a couple of examples of are um, galvanic cathodic protection systems. And uh, uh, the principal difference here is that you don't have a DC power supply and that the anode is directly connected to the steel. Um, the first example I'm going to show here is for a structure called the Garden City Skyway. This is a Ministry of Transportation Ontario structure. It's near Niagara Falls and this structure spans the Welland Canal, which is the connection be for shipping between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie on the Great Lakes. So this structure goes over the shipping um, canal there. And uh, in this particular situation, um, activated arc sprayed zinc, um, so a galvanic system, was to was applied to any of the piers that had less than 15% of the surface area of spalling um, and where they still had um, sound concrete with high corrosion potentials. The first step in this type of application is to do whatever concrete repairs need to be done because cathodic protection of any of these types will not fix concrete damage that already exists. So any of the areas of concrete delamination or spalling are identified. The edges are saw cut, the concrete is chipped out, and you can see some areas on the pier on the left and one little one up on the top on the right here, um, where they're doing good concrete repair um, details and techniques. Uh, those areas will be repaired. And in the case of um, arc sprayed zinc, which I'm going to show you here, it's real important that you allow those repair materials to cure long enough to get as much of the moisture out of the concrete as possible because the arc spray application is hot. And um, if there's too much humidity in the concrete, that can cause problems with the concrete bond or the bond of the zinc to the concrete. So once the concrete repairs are finished, um, the next step or the first step in the installation itself is surface preparation. Uh, this would be similar to surface preparation for um, metallized zinc in, for an impressed current system. Generally, it's done with uh, light abrasive blasting um, and you want to have a good, clean, um, dry surface to bond to. Uh, next, you're going to do application of the zinc um, itself. And, and here the zinc is going to be applied by electric arc. That's the same process that was used in the impressed current application I showed you before. And uh, in this process, zinc wires are melted essentially together and sprayed onto the molten zinc is sprayed onto the concrete surface. Um, typically, these systems are going to be installed at 12 mils or a little bit thicker, depending on the specification. Um, typical pull-off strengths that are going to be specified are going to be in the range of 150 PSI. Um, that's pretty reasonable in most situations. And a lot of these jobs are going to include the application of a humectant. A humectant is a material that absorbs moisture from the air and promotes the zinc to corrode. And that's important on these non-powered um, applications. There's no power supply. The zinc is connected directly to the reinforcing steel. And in order to get sufficient current out of the zinc, um, particularly in drier environments, uh, humectant is uh, very beneficial in that regard. Um, I have a short video here, which I think will uh, help you to see a little bit better how the application itself is done. Um, so after the concrete's prepared, um, here you can see spraying of the zinc, um, and you're going to spray the zinc in thin layers uh, using a crosshatch pattern. So you see he's going horizontally left to right here, 
you're going to build up another layer moving you know, in the vertical direction. Um, so you and and then going to go and you're going to typically build it up in many thin layers. Here's the um, metallizing equipment, which has the zinc wires on it that are basically being fed. You're going to check to make sure you've got your electrical connections to the zinc, and that's actually application of the humectant, which is most often applied by spray. But uh, hopefully that was a little bit of information for you. OK, so um, after the zinc is installed, obviously it's connected, electrically connected to the reinforcing steel. And similar to an impressed current system, these galvanic systems can be monitored. Um, and the things that you typically are going to monitor is the current that's flowing from the zinc to the steel, as well as a parameter called polarization or depolarization. Um, um, and there is a NACE or a National Association of Corrosion Engineers uh, criteria that if that polarization or depolarization is 100 millivolts or greater, that is uh, that means that the steel is fully cathodically protected. And from measuring the current, you can um, get an estimate on the remaining service life that exists there. OK, so. Um, arc spray zinc on the surface is one possibility. Another possibility is that you can use activated anodes. Um, and the, these two examples I'm going to show you. Um, first, this one is on a bridge deck where you have activated galvanic anodes being installed on a bridge deck. And they're, in this case, in, installed within a thin concrete overlay. And, and this is a table showing 20, uh, 20 years of performance data from that bridge that we just saw. And if you notice the column on the right-hand side of this table and the right-hand side of this table, these polarization values have consistently been 100 millivolts or greater, indicating that the polarization is sufficient that the steel is fully protected. Um, that is good if you have an exposed uh, concrete surface. If you have a very damaged surface, like these Ohio abutments that you see here, those surfaces can be rebuilt with uh, galvanic cathodic protection built into that surface, as illustrated by the photograph on the right, on the left, I should say. And, and similar to the last example, you can monitor the performance of the system and measure the polarization. And if it's designed and installed properly, uh, that should be 100 millivolts or greater, which it, it is in this case. Um, those are suitable for situations where you might have a certain amount of existing concrete damage and you need to overbuild the, the concrete surface. But there are a lot of situations out there where the existing concrete surface is perfectly fine, um, may have some limited delamination or spalls, and there's no need to overbuild the whole thing. So in those cases, you can use basically the same technique um, where you have surface mounted uh, distributed galvanic anode. Um, and these um, anodes are externally mounted on the concrete surface. They're mechanically fastened to it. And there's a layer of mortar between the anode and the and the concrete surface to provide the ionic connection. Um, obviously, these types of anodes would not be put on a traffic surface <laughs> directly, um, but they can be used to provide protection very um, economically um, in areas where you have you know, exposed concrete conditions as illustrated on the left or sheltered conditions here on the right or where you've got thin or, or shallow members, which might be difficult to, you want to minimize the amount of concrete removal, um, as long as the fact that they're mounted on the surface doesn't get in the way of, you know, you, know, you wouldn't want to, like I say, put it on the driving surface where it would create uh, a bump um, that would be problematic, it wouldn't stand up to that. So these anodes are installed 
um, uh, like I said, just on the concrete surface after whatever concrete repairs are completed. Here you can see a, an abutment for a bridge and I'll play a short time lapse video here. Um, and you can see the installation of the individual um, anode uh, units. The electrical connections between the units are connected together and connected to the steel and then covered with um, basically um, a bridging piece so it uh, can look reasonably uh, finished um, and pretty non-intrusive in terms of the amount of work that you need to do to the concrete surface itself. The um, All of these systems, all of the previous examples and this as well can be monitored and it's it's important to monitor at least a portion of the of the areas just to make sure that you're getting what you you know what you're paying for and make sure it's working properly uh, they can also be remotely monitored if um, <clears throat> if that is desired um, the design process um, there are nace standards for <clears throat> design as well as uh, and obviously for the performance for both impressed current systems and galvanic systems. The number that's mentioned here SP0216 is the standard for galvanic cathodic protection for steel in reinforced concrete. There is a similar standard for impressed current um, cathodic protection and and these systems can be designed to um, in accordance with those standards and they can be tested in accordance with the standards, which is I think really important and it's something that you should reference in your specifications if you are uh, specifying these types of systems. So just to show you, I wanna close by showing you a couple of examples of this last type, which is the surface mounted um, anode. So in the surface mounted application, um, Obviously, you need to clean the existing concrete surface. So if it's covered with a coating or graffiti, as in this case, um, that needs to be removed. It doesn't necessarily have to be removed everywhere, but it has to be removed in the area where the direct area where the anode will be applied. Um, and so you can see on the right hand photo here that the uh, sections here, here, here and here, um, the coating has been removed because that's where the anodes will be installed. Um, the anodes, um, basically you apply a layer of mortar, cementitious mortar to the back of the anode. The anodes are then put in place and um, you drill and they're mechanically anchored in place as illustrated here on the, on the right. Not all the wiring's completed at the point of that picture. And then once everything is connected, at least for the monitored sections, you can monitor the data. Um, and this is a Kentucky uh, transportation cabinet project. And on this particular job, they're monitoring three things. They're monitoring the temperature, which is shown by the green line. Um, they're monitoring the current that's flowing from the anodes to the steel, uh, shown by the blue line here. And you can see that the current tends to follow what happens in the in the temperature line, current is definitely um, varies in proportion to the temperature, but it also varies in proportion to humidity and moisture. So when you get rain situations, the current will jump up um, because the concrete resistance will go down. So they're measuring current and temperature, and they're also measuring um, polarization or depolarization that I've mentioned before. And in their case, you can see that, you know, it would have started at zero down here and then they're monitoring and within about two weeks, 14 days, um, the polarization is getting above 100. And so from that point forward, the, the steel is meeting the AMP or NACE cathodic protection criteria. Um, and it does take a little bit of time. You have to pass current to the steel for a little bit of time to build up that protection. But once you do, then, um, you know, you know, if it keeps working, it should stay above that line for a long period of time. And um, the final example I 
just wanted to show you um, is uh, a different application of the same type of system. Um, this is a job that was done um, last year in uh, Italy for the National Highway uh, System or the basically the toll road system there. Um, and what they were dealing with is a number of bridges. Um, most of them were relatively small, um, basically box culvert uh, structures. They had widened the um, this whole section of expressway a number of years before, and uh, they were having leakage at the joint between the new and the old portion of the uh, structure. And uh, so instead of trying to provide cathartic protection to the whole box culvert in this case, or the whole bridge, um, they are providing uh, cathartic protection just to a section on each side of the joint between the old and the new where they're having the leakage and the and they've got chloride contamination as a result of that. So again, the application here is once the concrete surfaces are prepared, apply mortar to the back of the um, um, anode units. Basically install the anode units in place. Um, push them up there, anchor the edges, make the electrical connections between. So you can see the electrical connections here are not connected yet. So the anodes are installed, but the anodes are not connected yet. And here you can see those connections have been made and covered. And you've got basically a section of the structure that's protected on each side. This is one side of the joint and similar situation on the upper or left side of that same joint. So uh, I just wanted to show you that example. So to summarize, um, the objective today was to show you some surface applied cathodic protection systems and um, I think hopefully most interestingly show you some project examples. Um, and the objective was to show you project examples that included impressed current cathodic protection, examples that were electrochemical chloride extraction, as well as examples that um, illustrated galvanic cathodic protection, because all three different methods are um, available and all of them are possible. And depending on the situation, you might choose one over another. Um, I wanted to show you the installation steps, at least what I could do in a 45 minute uh, webinar. Um, so the basic installation steps and to very briefly touch on the pros and cons of the different approaches. And, uh, and also to illustrate that, you know, in addition to showing you the systems themselves, to show you some um, data related to the corrosion protection performance of these different surface mounted uh, cathodic protection systems. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, I think we have a few minutes available for questions. I think Ben, I cannot see the questions in the chat or anything, but I believe the protocol is to enter the questions into the chat and uh, and we'll go from there. So thank you very much for your time and have a great rest of your afternoon. That great. is exactly right there. Uh, Dave, thanks for uh, that excellent presentation. Uh, we'll get started on the Q&A here. They have been uh, flying in, uh, piling in here. Uh, we're obviously not going to be able to get through all of them. So uh, they're also uh, there's some some fierce competition in here because there, there's a lot of really good questions as well. So uh, okay. I think everyone really wants that uh, that prize at the end. So uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, these will be delivered to Dave after the show and uh, and he'll be able to. Well, as long as you give us your name uh, here, uh, try to give us your information. Uh, we can connect you uh, with Dave after the show and he can uh, answer some of these questions for you. Okay. So to get started, um, we got a uh, first question here from Eric. He's asking uh, compared to so sorry, looking at uh, the uh, ECE versus realkalization versus galvanic, uh, what scenarios would you uh, pick one uh, versus the other? 
why would you pick a, a in press current or press current system or electrochemical extraction chemical system? Point. Yeah, so uh, there's obviously there's pros and cons to each of those um, systems. Um, you know, uh, impressed current systems have the advantage that you can adjust the level of protection by adjusting the rectifier, assuming it's within the limits of your rectifier and the anodes that have been installed. Um, so that's a that's a big advantage there. Um, obviously, a disadvantage on that side would be the uh, you have an active electrical system that you need to maintain on the structure for the remaining life of the structure or at least the remaining life that you want the system to work for. And for some owners, um, you know, that may or may not be acceptable. Um, for electrochemical chloride extraction, um, you know, the fact that you don't have a permanent system that you need to maintain um, could be a big advantage. Um, if you have, um, if you have a lot of, um, if you have a very severely chloride contaminated structure or if you have a lot of concrete damage already, it may be beyond what is practically possible to do with chloride extraction. Similarly, if you cannot prevent the structure from being recontaminated again, for example, like a marine um, bridge that's going to be directly exposed to salt water <laughs> forever, um, temporarily pulling the chlorides out of that probably although you can do it, is probably not a good long-term um, use of your funds. Um, galvanic systems, uh, probably one of the main advantages there is that you have, because you don't have a power supply, yeah, you don't have the same maintenance and monitoring or the risk of the electrical system going down. Um, you can do small areas very economically with galvanic systems. Um, compared to impressed current. So there's pros and cons to each uh, each approach. Excellent. Uh, Brady asks, uh, besides chloride, what other chemicals, if any, uh, should you be worried about when it comes to corrosion and corrosion protection? Um, well, in bridges, seeing this is a bridge focus <laughs> seminar, um, I would say the main one is chlorides, um, whether they're from de-icing salts or whether they're from marine applications those are the main um, the main two if you have an old structure um, like a hundred year old bridge or even these 80 90 year old bridges that we're talking about you may also run into a problem with carbonation and carbonation induced corrosion as well um, particularly if your concrete is relatively porous or your cover isn't really good um, in bridges, those would be the main two things that you're going to run into. Um, if we were having this discussion on a broader basis that included more industrial and building and those kind of things, um, there's a there are a bunch of other chemicals, for example, bromide, um, which isn't something you're going to run into on a bridge, but a lot of old refrigeration systems used to use bromide. Um, in the refrigeration system and where they spilt um, those bromide solutions on the concrete in some old government buildings and that kind of stuff, uh, that is very corrosive to the reinforcing steel, arguably more corrosive than chloride. Um, and certainly in other petrochemical and other places, there's other nasty things around that can cause problems. But bridges, it would be, I mean, it would be chlorides and carbonation if you're talking about older structures. Excellent. Uh, Eric asks, uh, after the uh, external anodes have con been consumed, uh, can they also be replaced to uh, continue the protection on the structure? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, uh, I would say that's one of the primary advantages of, of surface mounted. Um, cathodic protection systems in general is that because they're on the surface, they are accessible and can either be removed and replaced or in some cases maybe just supplemented. Um, and that can be done because they're readily accessible on the surface. Albeit, just recognize that because it's on the surface, there's also places where they're probably not appropriate to use, particularly places where you're exposed to 
direct traffic, snow plows, <laughs> those kind of things. Um, it, you probably wouldn't want to use something that's directly on the surface in those situations. Excellent. Uh, Britton asks, uh, what are the benefits of installing an arc spray system versus a, a surface mounted anode? Ooh, that's a, what's the advantages? Um, if you had a big wide, if you have a big wide area where um, you need to protect a like a large, large area, you probably would lean maybe more in the side of uh, maybe arc sprayed zinc um, type of system. Um, if you had more targeted protection, um, like the area around joints or um, you know, maybe the base of columns that you're not, you're only protecting kind of small, smaller areas, or maybe a lot of small areas that are scattered over a large structure. Um, that probably is going to lean you much more in the area of uh, surface mounted anodes, um, being a lot easier to install in bits and pieces. Yeah, I think I definitely read his question wrong because he, he well, asked. Well, maybe uh, I read, maybe the, I what's misunderstood. What's the benefits of the surface mounted one? <laughs> What is what? What's the benefit of uh, of the surface mounted versus the arc spray zinc? He oh, says that would be much easier and cheaper oh. to install. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So I would say the main benefit of the surface mounted would be that it's uh, it's it's an activated system and um, and the activated system it's all carried within. So I think you would have more predictable or more uniform corrosion protection performance out of that than the arc spray, which is going to be much more dependent on the environmental conditions and the environmental exposure. All right, we got a few questions asking uh, which of these systems might work in uh, sur submerged or semi-submerged uh, situations? Submerged or semi-submerged? Um, I would say of the ones that we talked about today, um, the the best of those ones for submerged or semi-submerged conditions would be the surface mounted, um, um, the last um, examples that I showed. Um, does stray current affect any of these cathodic protection methods? Um, stray current is potentially an issue uh, with any of them. It's definitely more of an issue with the impressed current ones. Um, and the galvanic ones, um, it's theoretically an issue, although honestly, I've never seen any actual damage uh, caused by it, even when it's existed. So I would say uh, stray current is more of an issue with, um, from a practical point of view, is more of an issue with either of the two impressed current um, examples that I showed. All right, uh, Awald uh, has got a question here. Do surface applied anodes have to be attached to the rebar to work or can applying to the surface allow some protection? Okay, that's a, that's a good question and maybe I wasn't clear enough in my explanation. Um, all of these systems, all all of the systems that I've uh, illustrated today, all of them require electrical connection to the reinforcing steel. Um, not every single anode or every single square foot of anode needs to be individually connected to the an uh, to the uh, to the rebar, but there needs to be connections to the rebar. And I would say typically they would have to have maybe one connection for every 500 square feet or so of surface area would be a typical requirement that you would have. All right, I think we are out of time. We've uh, we've struck the, the two o'clock central time here. So uh, if you did have any more questions that you didn't get to you know, during the show or if uh, you think okay. of something else later on, uh, there's Dave's uh, information reach out to him. He's always thinking about uh, concrete and protection and sustainability. So please feel free to, to reach out with your questions. And uh, yeah, with that said, the webinar recording as well as the slides are going to be available on our website at wesavestructures.info. Uh, same place that you would have gone to register. Uh, that's also where you'll be able to see uh, 
any of our future events that are coming up. Uh, as as we said, there's new ones coming from us as well as NCBC. So please check back at our websites. And uh, with that, thank you, Dave, uh, for running us through those questions. Everyone will get those questions to him uh, after the show, and he'll be able to reach out to you. And he'll he'll pick out the best one, and we'll reach out to that person. Uh, and also thank you, Greg, for uh, helping us put on this uh, awesome thank you. series. Yes. Yeah, and I was going to say, and a final thank you to to you all. Uh, this is the last of the of the current series, um, but I would encourage you, if you missed one and you want to go back, those recordings are available. So that's a great opportunity to watch those uh, at your leisure, uh, and also pick up on those those that are coming. The ones uh, that Vector is doing uh, on design, I think, have a lot of. Uh, should have a lot of interest as well as the ones that the National Concrete Bridge Council is going to be doing on a, a kind of a wide range of topics. So again, thank you, everybody. Great series, great attendance today and uh, great discussion as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to work with you on these webinars. And, Absolutely. Uh, thank you to everyone that attended. Thank you. Let's get out there and save some structures.